for more, let's cross to the Ukrainian capital. Yuri Sak is advisor uh, to the defense minister there. Thank you so much for speaking with us here on France 24. Thank you very much for inviting me. Lots to talk about, uh, uh, including the latest from the battlefront. First, though, just a quick reaction to, to what we saw in that report. The, the Russians, you heard that one person saying how the Russians and the Ukrainians are competing for the same spare parts when it comes to drones. Well, indeed, drones are a very important part of this uh, warfare. Ukrainian army has been using drones from day one of the large scale invasion very successfully. Uh, we are, you know, changing uh, the tactics on the battlefield depending on uh, the available uh, technology. We are improving that technology. And I have to agree with the report that you were just showing. Um, Russians are trying to catch up as well. Uh, and at the moment, it's 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 a very tough competition. A, a tough competition there, and uh, what's also uh, uh, one of those uh, known unknowns, if you will, on the battlefield, are landmines. How much are they slowing down your counteroffensive? Russian aggressors have uh, laid millions of these mines uh, along the front line, and it's a very long front line as well. It's over 900 kilometers. So, uh, you know, it is slowing down certain military operations, but at the same time, it's not come as a surprise to us. We knew uh, what Russians were doing to prepare for our offensive operations for months. They've been building up these uh, very heavily fortified um, defense lines. They've been laying mines and uh, it's, it's something we were prepared for, and it's something we take into account when executing our military operations uh, now. And like you rightly pointed out as well in your earlier report, Ukrainian army is gaining uh, ground every day. I mean, sometimes we move forward 100, uh, one kilometer, sometimes it's a kilometer and a half, sometimes less. But every day we are gaining ground. Every day we are liberating Ukrainian lands. And when you hear that uh, uh, there are Russian generals who haven't been seen in public since Saturday, what is your reaction? What's the calculus on the Ukrainian side? Well, we all knew before this strange uprising took place in Russia, we all knew that Russia is a terrorist state and Russia is a state which is run by war criminals. Now we also know that Russia is a failed state because only in a failed state such uh, strange things can happen uh, without any explanation. We have no idea, you know, what exactly is going on, where are these generals. Uh, we continue with our military objective, which is to liberate Ukrainian land from these war criminals and terrorists. And to us, they're all war criminals and terrorists uh, on both sides. So uh, whatever makes Russia weaker, makes us stronger, brings our victory closer. And uh, one thing we, I think, all see now is that the regime in Russia is in panic and they're very afraid. They're afraid of the possible internal instability because, you know, you can only lie for a certain time, but when your lies become so gigantic that even your own people stop believing you, then, you know, certain things become obvious and internal instability sooner or later will result in weakness on the front lines of the army of the aggressor. There's the ground war and the information war, Yuri Sak. Uh, immediately after Saturday, uh, we saw Ukraine's president on the front lines uh, and uh, uh, with uh, fraternizing with uh, the soldiers that are fighting. Vladimir Putin g going to ground, it seemed, for a while. There were these strange images that appeared on Wednesday of him in Dagestan. Now he's appeared this Thursday at a conference. Uh, your thoughts on the contrast there? I wouldn't want to speculate, but uh, a lot of what we see looks like a desperate attempt to hide something. Our president, Mr. Zelensky, from the very first day, as you remember, he said, 
when he was faced with a threat to his life. And we all know that this was one of the objective of these terrorists, to destroy the leadership of Ukraine. So faced with the risk, our president didn't abandon his people. And he said, I need ammunition, not a ride. Now, we are seeing the absolute opposite uh, in Russia. We see a president who is hiding from his own people, who at the first sign of some threat disappeared. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, his behavior is very strange uh, also because, you know, a week and a half ago when he's meeting his journalists, he requires them to be on quarantine for a week. And then he's in the crowd of people giving hugs to kids. I mean, that doesn't sound and doesn't look very uh, OK. Uh, so it's not it's no not it's not it's not business as usual. Let's uh, a word, uh, an update, if you will, on Kramatorsk. Uh, we have news of a 12th person succumbing. What, do we know more about the victims from the, from that uh, uh, restaurant uh, uh, missile, the, the, the missile that hit that restaurant than we did a, a day ago? Well, indeed, today another body was uncovered from the rubble and uh, the total death toll for now from that uh, missile strike is 12 people. Um, among those who were actually in that pizza place at the time when the strike occurred, there were uh, also foreign nationals. There were three nationals from Colombia. One of them is the former head of the International Human Rights Court. And uh, the government of Colombia today already issued a note of protest to the Russian government because they are rightly uh, convinced that, you know, this attack endangered the life of their citizens. But for us, it's a tragedy also because, you know, in addition to these being peaceful civilians, there were three children who were killed by that missile strike. And that's again, that, that just again proves that Russia is a failed terrorist state because unable to achieve anything on the front line, the only thing they can do is continue to terrorize Ukrainian people by missile strikes on civilian uh, peaceful cities and uh, objects. Now, they, they probably want to break our will to fight. They probably want to achieve some uh, effect by that. But the effect will be the opposite. Everything that they are doing only makes us Ukrainians more angry and more determined to continue to fight. And, you know, we will win this war and we will bring these war criminals to justice, including all their leadership. Russia claims to have killed two Ukrainian generals in Kramatorsk two days ago. Your reaction? Now, look, uh, we it's about time we all stop listening to what Russia is saying, because every time they move their lips, they're lying. I mean, uh, about everything. So I, I'm not even sure how to comment. What's the military situation around Kramatorsk? How close is the fighting to the city? Well, Kramatorsk is, uh, you know, not very far at all from the front lines, but uh, it is a city which is under Ukrainian control. And, uh, for example, it's a city where a lot of foreign journalists travel and they stay there when they're doing their reports from the front lines. You know, they stay in Kramatorsk, they travel to front lines and then come back. So uh, Kramatorsk has been a target of uh, missile strikes, of uh, bombardments uh, during the last couple of months a lot because, you know, it's... Uh, uh, not far from Bakhmut, uh, actually one of the most uh, uh, hot and uh, one of the epicenters of the fierce battles. So, but they cannot reach it with uh, their hands, put it that way. So they're trying to reach it with missiles and, and, and bombardments. NATO is, is, according to the United States, nearing consensus on uh, how to address Ukraine's membership push and at the same time, uh, there is talk this Thursday in Brussels at an EU summit of uh, how to uh, uh, step up even more uh, commitments uh, to helping uh, the war effort uh, for Ukraine. Uh, any comment on uh, what you're expecting from that summit in Brussels? From the summit in uh, Vilnius, the NATO summit, because that will be the main event. So. Our expectation is very clear and very realistic. We expect NATO countries to give Ukraine guarantees of full-fledged membership after this war is over. We are realistic. We understand that while the war continues to rage, 
it is not possible uh, to join for Ukraine to join NATO alliance. But in essence, de facto, and this is something our Minister of Defense says almost on a daily basis, Ukraine already is a member of NATO de facto because we are protecting the eastern flank of NATO. We are stopping the Russian aggression from spilling over to our eastern European uh, neighbors, countries such as the Baltic states, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia. And look, we all understand understand that you know Russian uh, aggression is uh, unless it is stopped in Ukraine it will uh, spread further west so we are um, we have achieved a high level of interoperability of our army with the NATO countries we are using the same standards when it comes to procurement systems uh, we are relying on the same systems for uh, reconnaissance and intelligence data collection so uh, in fact Ukraine joining NATO is almost a formality, but we want to hear that guarantee from our NATO uh, allies uh, that after the war is over, Ukraine will become a fully fledged member of this alliance. And that summit taking place uh, July 11th and 12th uh, in Vilnius. Yuri Sachs, so many thanks for speaking with us from Kyiv. Thank you very much for inviting me again.